The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. Oh, round of applause, okay. Great, so... Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3, if you've got Bibles, and um, if people don't have, do you ever put verses on screen? That I've, I've just probably caused, no, don't worry about it, find a Bible, and uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3 from verse 13 to the end, and um, you've got Baptism Sunday coming up in February, that's very exciting, and I want to, I want to speak to you the truth about baptism, which is also the truth about the cosmos, Okay. When you look at a baptism, you're seeing a microcosm of the whole world, the heavens and the earth, okay? It's a cosmic reality as we look at baptism. And if you want to explain your faith to your friends, I can't think of a better thing to do than to just explain what baptism is. I've been tasked with explaining how to share your faith in the modern world. And that's kind of my job. I'm an evangelist, and I shoot my mouth off about Jesus. Uh, I've been doing that for about 20 years. I grew up in Australia. I now live in Eastbourne with my wife, Emma, and uh, Ruby and JJ. And uh, yeah, my day job is really to rabbit on and on and on about Jesus, Uh, whether that's received warmly or whether I get the cold shoulder or something in between. Um, I actually love talking about Jesus. And if you heard that today was about learning how to share your faith, I wonder if you thought twice about coming this morning, because it can feel like a daunting task, can't it, to share Jesus with others. But I always take comfort from a verse in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's just an iron rule of human personality. What grips your heart wags your tongue. It's just the way it works. Often I tell people about evangelism and they say to me afterwards, oh, Glenn, it's okay for you. You have a way with words. I'm not so good with words. And it's always a shock to me when they say that because we've usually shared about five minutes of conversation before they've admitted this. And they haven't committed any grand faux pas. They haven't sort of put their foot in it. I've understood what they've said. I haven't felt offended or rude. They haven't tumbled up in their words and not being able to communicate. They, they're very good with words. Most people are fine with words, actually. It just depends what topic we're on. And we're very good talking about the weather and the football and the cricket, right? And the grandkids and the latest purchase or whatever it is, the, the holiday. We're very good talking about those things. Everybody is decent enough with words if you just get them onto the right topic. And Jesus said, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever fills your heart will overflow. So actually this morning, as I try to equip you to share Jesus, I just want to fill your heart with Jesus. I want to preach the gospel to you so that you can preach the gospel to your friends and family. That's that's what we're going to do. I hope it's not going to be too arduous. We're going to look again at Jesus until we get excited about him because you tend to talk about what you're excited about. As we begin, I'm going to read from verse 13 to verse 17 of Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to talk about, in particular, one phrase. It says, the heavens opened. The heavens opened. I wonder what you think you would see if the heavens opened. Uh, We're in England. You know what you'd see? Rain, right? (laughs) That's, That's the way the phrase is usually used, isn't it? And that's quite biblical, too. Back in Noah's day... The flood came when the heavens opened. So sometimes the Bible uses the phrase, the heavens opened, in that way. It's about rain falling. But a couple of times in the Bible, literally the heavens open. Literally the curtain parts and we get to see into the cockpit of all reality. We get to see ultimate reality itself. What would it be like to see heaven? Matthew 3, from verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, that's the Jordan River, to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? 
Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If you were to see into heaven, what would you see? Well, we can't. And when we try to look up, it's almost as though the heavens are like a mirror and they just reflect back to us the kind of God we imagine in our heads. Have you ever noticed how warlike people have looked up into the heavens and imagined warlike gods? And you're like, well, big surprise. If you think the greatest thing on earth is military might, how are you going to imagine God or the gods? You're going to imagine a big bruiser, aren't you? Like a massive spear or thunderbolt ready to hurl. That's what you're going to imagine. Of course you are. Thor with a huge hammer. Of course, if that's what you think earthly greatness is, you look up into the heavens and you just project. You just project kind of earthly greatness and you pump that up on steroids and you thrust that up into the heavens and you say, well, yeah, that's probably what God's like. Have you ever noticed that? That, that warlike people imagine warlike gods? And groovy people imagine groovy gods, don't they? Right? If you think that the greatest thing on earth is, you know, love and groovy vibes, what do you think spiritual reality is like? It's just, it's just one big party, isn't it? Like, with a, it's just lava lamps everywhere. That's, that's what, it's just a vibe, right? Warlike people believe in warlike gods and groovy people believe in groovy gods. Because you know what? The heavens normally are like a mirror. And we look up and we might think that we're talking about God. Usually we're just talking about ourselves in a loud voice. There's a big problem. The Bible says the problem is that we are disconnected from the life of heaven. Totally disconnected. As we got out our phones earlier... I thought to myself, it's interesting, like I went onto my notes app on my phone and your notes app is a, is a really limited thing to do on your phone, isn't it? When you think of all the things your phone can do, to go onto your phone and just like list down whatever it was. I, I've, I've forgotten all 20 of them now. What? Fondue. Everyone remembers the fondue set now, don't they? And there was Cuddly Toy, my, my daughter remembered Cuddly Toy. And, like, and just to, to write down words in a little text app, that's a really limited use of this. This is an incredibly complicated bit of computing technology, isn't it? Like the, the computer that sent people to the moon was far less sophisticated than this. And you've got one of these in your pocket. It's amazing, isn't it? How this is a technical masterpiece. It's a piece of genius. But really, sometimes you only just like, use it for a calculator, don't you? Or sometimes you just play snake IO or something. You just, just play snake on your phone or something very limited. When actually this can connect you to the entirety of the world. And within moments, I can make a message ricochet around the world and get connected to other people. And other people can can connect to me and answer that and back and forwards it goes and I can make a video and I can, I can make a Hollywood movie on this thing, right? And then connect it to the rest of the world and then suddenly I'm, I'm online. But like imagine that every single mobile phone tower was destroyed somehow. Somebody had disrupted all the signals so that there's just no such thing as the internet. It's all gone. No connectivity whatsoever. And then imagine you've just got this like black mirror in your pocket. And it's got some limited functionality. You know, you can write down lava lamp, or you can write down fondue set, you can write down microwave, but you can't do very much with it. But imagine without that connectivity, you'd suddenly get obsessed with the thing itself, wouldn't you? 
and you'd use it as like a bookmark or a paperweight or something. Or, or some people could get, get really sophisticated. They could look into the phone and they could discover that there's all sorts of circuitry in there that's very intricate and very interesting. And they, they might suddenly get really, really interested in the internal kind of technology of the phone. But imagine it goes on generation after generation. We're not connected online. We've just got these things in our pockets. And people suddenly get really interested in just the screen. Really interested in the fact that the camera can kind of do this or that. But it's not connected. The Bible says that's what human beings are like, right? Human beings are made for heaven. We're, we're made to be connected to the Most High God in the great high priest Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit and in connection with the living God. Heaven is meant to be open to us the entire time. We're meant to have a minute by minute, second by second connection with heaven and with angels and archangels and a, and a whole universe that is just thrumming with the glory of God. But we're mostly these disconnected people who get really interested in this, just the minutiae of little daily life. We live such limited lives normally. We're utterly disconnected from the connectivity that is out there. And we live these little atomized, narrow, small lives. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus kind of from heaven earths himself into our humanity and he is the connection point and did you notice in this verse as soon as Jesus was baptized he went up out of the water at that moment heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending and he heard the voice from heaven saying you are my son who I love he is the connection point and he bursts into our lives and most of us are just living our tiny little lives curved in on ourselves. Thinking that life is about really small, tiny, limited concerns and wondering whether it's worth it. There's so much despair in the world right now. You know why there's so much despair in the world? It's because it's we've lost all the connectivity points. We, we don't even believe in connectivity. We're treating ourselves like we're just black mirrors. And we just become obsessed with the here and now, with the small, with the limited. And Jesus bursts in. He says, I'll open heaven to you. I am the son of the father, full of the spirit. I was there in the beginning. Life is not small. Life is not limited. Life is an expansive relationship of love. Before the world began. The father was saying, I love you, my son. I'm so proud of you. And in the power of the spirit, the, the father was communicating his love to Jesus, the son. And Jesus, the son was communicating his love back to the father. I love you too. There has been forever an eternal communion of love. Father loving his son, Jesus, in the joy of the Holy Spirit. What you see here in the baptism is the party that's been happening from before the world began. Do you ever think about that before the world began? Have you ever thought about that as a thought experiment? Imagine hitting rewind on the video of reality. And you just hit rewind. And back you go. And you go back a very, very long way. You go back before there are people, before there are planets, before there are protons. All the way back. What's there? What was there in the beginning. That's the phrase that begins Genesis, first book of the Bible. It begins John's gospel. In the beginning. What's your vision for in the beginning? I do this exercise with lots of people. And even Christians say to me, what's there in the beginning? Well, nothing. What, before the universe? Huh. The universe is everything, right? Are you a Christian? What? Before the universe, there was not nothing. The universe is not everything. Before the universe, there was, okay, there was God. Great, okay, so you've given the Christian answer. Before the universe was, there was God. Which God are you imagining? Are you imagining 
Thor, right? Odin, Osiris, which god? Which god are you thinking about in the beginning? The god of Jesus, the god that Jesus has revealed to the world is a loving union of three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the eternal Son who has forever been calling out to his Father in the joy of the Holy Spirit. And the Father has been answering back, filling him with the Spirit and proclaiming his love. In the beginning, there was love. That's quite, a, that's quite an appealing vision for reality, isn't it, wouldn't you say? When you think of all the different visions of reality that people have had, like you ask the, the, the Norse myths and you say, well, like, where have we come from? We've come from warfare and death and intrigue and deceit and, and here we all are. Well, you ask the Greeks, where have we come from? And it's this, this horrific kind of melee of sex and death and murder and violence and here we all are. Or you just go nowadays to a, a very modern atheistic vision. Where have we all come from? Bang. Crash. Accident, 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 accident. And then selfishness, 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 selfishness. And here we all are. Every vision for where we have come from is an appalling vision. A disgusting vision at times. Certainly a bleak vision. Where have we come from? We've come from love. In the beginning there was love. We've come from love. We've been shaped by love. We are intended for love. All of us are living our tiny little lives, staring into our little black mirrors, completely unconcerned for the life of heaven and the angels and the archangels and all that connectivity and... A world that's thrumming with the glory of God. We've forgotten all that and we live these tiny little lives and Jesus breaks in and he says, it's about love. Come on, it's about love. There has forever been an almighty, you are my son who I love with you, I am well pleased. That's been echoing around heaven from all eternity. And that is the true nature of this world. The true nature of this world is we have come from love. We are shaped by love. We are intended for love. But we've gotten disconnected, haven't we? And in Matthew chapter 3, this picture of disconnection is that for people to get reconnected back to the source, they need to admit they're in a desert place. All of this happens in Matthew chapter 3 at the Jordan River, which is kind of carving its way through this wilderness, this sandy, dry desert. Matthew 3 from verse 1 in those days, John the Baptist, who's actually John, uh, Jesus' cousin, he's a guy whose whole job was to wash people in the River Jordan, give them a bath. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Isn't that interesting? John's got a message from heaven. God is a fountain of life and light and love. And you guys are in a desert place. You're perishing. You're dying of thirst. God is a Niagara Falls of blessing. And here we are in a wilderness, just trying to get kicks out of whatever we can get kicks out of. And oh, look, here's a bucket of salt. And my goodness, I'm thirsty for the water of life, but at least that bucket of salt will give me a bit of kick. And so here we are, dying, parched, perishing. And John's like, that's because you've been heading away from the fountain. Of course you're in a desert place. If you're disconnected from love, well, of course you live in a world full of hatred and disconnection, right? If you've walked away from the God who is life, well, of course you're dying. Of course you're perishing. If you've walked away from the God who is light, of course you're wandering in darkness. That's the human condition, isn't it? In the beginning, there was light and life and love, a father loving his son Jesus in the joy of the Holy Spirit. But we look at the world today and it's not like that. The world is full of darkness and death and disconnection. Where's that come from? 
Well, we were made for the light, but if you say no to the light, I guess you get darkness. If you say no to love, I, I guess you get disconnection. If you say no to life, if you say no to the one who is life, of course you get death. So here we are in this desert of death and disconnection and darkness. And here comes John and he, he just says, will you please turn around? It's what repent means. Will you please turn around? You, you've walked away from the fountain of life. No wonder you're perishing of thirst, but just, just come back. Turn around. Come home. And John is urging people to do that. And he's actually a really popular preacher. You might think that's curious. If John is coming and he's saying, you guys are all sinners. That's what we're talking about here. You're all sinners. You must repent. That might be, you might think that that would be an unpopular message. But actually, I can see how that could be popular. Because we want to get authentic, don't we? We want to own up to the truth. We don't, we don't want to wear masks, do we? We don't want pretense. We don't want hypocrisy. We want to come clean, don't we? Because actually, that's where change really happens in life. I spend my life, stupidly, I spend my life trying to look good in the presence of judgment. That's what I'm always trying to do. It's also what makes online life so difficult, isn't it? What are we all trying to do on Instagram, right? We're all trying to look good in the presence of judgment. So you better retake the selfie 17 times and put on the right filter and right. We want to look good in the presence of judgment. But that's not just Instagram. That's all of life. I come into this room. You've come into this room and some part of you is saying, I want to put my best foot forward, don't I? I, I want to come across in the best light. Don't we all think that? I mean, church is the one place where we should and where we can drop the act. But there's always that voice, isn't there? You always just want to look good in the presence of judgment. And so you just put your best foot forward. You wear that mask. You kind of... But nothing ever changes in your life if that's your mentality. Look good in the presence of judgment. Look good in the presence of judgment. Because you know that underneath the mask, there's darkness there. And John comes along with this message. He's like, drop the act. God sees through it. Who are you fooling? Don't try to look good in the presence of judgment. Look bad in the presence of love. And that's what baptism is. And that's the meaning of life. Right? The meaning of life is stop trying to look good in the presence of judgment. Drop the act. Look bad in the presence of love. And that's where real change happens. Do you ever get that in a relationship with somebody? You know, over the years, as you, as you try to get to know this one person, you're on your best behavior. But then at some stage, you're really comfortable with them. And you just pick your nose in their presence, and they just like, like <laughs> you've dropped the act all of a sudden. And then it goes downhill from there. I, I, I could gross you all out, but yeah, that's, that's the easy one to share, all right? But at some point, you sort of take off the mask. Is it okay to be me? And you know, the best thing in life is when somebody says, I see that, and I'm sticking with you, right? It's the best thing in the world. The worst thing in the world is you open up and they run a mile. It's the worst thing in the world. What's God like? God's the one who sees behind the mask anyway. And he's like, please just fess up. Please. I love you. But nothing changes until you drop the act. My love won't get through while you're wearing the mask. So please, repent and believe. Won't you just drop the act? Repent and believe. Look bad in the presence of love. And so actually at this Baptism at this river, it's, it's basically the failures convention, isn't it? It's the failures convention and the cues are going out the block, right? It's like, come one, come all. Losers only, you must be a loser. Roll up, roll up, and everybody does roll up. 
because they just want to get honest. Do you want to get honest? Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you've never come to this point of, of saying, yeah, I want to drop the act and, and do this thing. Are you ready to do it? Maybe even today? Not baptism. Baptism Sunday is a few weeks' time. And you can talk to the leadership about all that. But today, you can genuinely repent and believe. Today, it's so liberating. People in this room, they'll tell you, it's so liberating. Oh, my goodness. There's someone who loves you to hell and back. He sees it all anyway. Repent, believe. It's brilliant. But in Matthew chapter 3, here they are at the failures convention. They're all queuing up to take a bath. And who shows up except the perfect, pure son of God? He shows up at the failures convention and he joins the queue, right? Alongside all the other messy people. What's he doing? Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee, where he grew up, to the Jordan River down south to be baptized by John. And now everyone's scandalized. Because think of all the ways that that verse could go. It, it could say, Jesus came from, where does he come from? From Galilee to the Failures Convention to judge all the filthy sinners. Quite right too. It's a fair cop. I mean, they've all admitted it. They've all pleaded guilty. So here comes the judge for sentencing, right? Is that what this should be? Maybe that's what some people would have expected. Everybody pleads guilty, and the judge of all the world shows up. So we might expect the gavel to fall, and Jesus judges everybody. Okay. Might be one way the verse goes. Or you might think Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to baptize everybody else. Isn't that the way you might expect the verse to go? Well, here comes the one who's been in on the fountain of life for from forever, right? So now's his chance to kind of to bathe and cleanse all the sinners. It could be a lovely pastoral scene. Can you imagine it? Grandma might cross-stitch it and put it up on a wall hanging somewhere. There is Jesus baptizing the others. And wouldn't that be a lovely pastoral scene? But it's, that's not what it says. Jesus comes to the failures convention and he joins the queue. And he gets to the front of the queue and he says, I want to get baptized too. What? The perfect, pure Son of God, the one who has been in on the fountain of life from before the world began, the one who has never been disconnected from God, never sinned. What's he doing in the queue? That's what John the Baptist thinks. Verse 14, John tried to deter him. <laughs> There's so many hilarious times in the Gospels where people try and tell Jesus what to do. It's just like, yeah, word to the wise Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about, John? He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's like, John... John says to Jesus, look, my advice is, let's not do this. Think of the optics, Jesus, right? Think of the PR department. It's a public relations disaster for Team Jesus, isn't it? Because what does it look like? It looks like he might be disconnected. It looks like he might be a sinner. He might be dark and dirty and need that bath. Isn't that how it might look? So John tries to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. What's Jesus saying to John? He's, he's saying, look, this is the way it has to be. I join you in your filth so you can join me in my family. You could write that sentence over Matthew chapter 3. You could write that sentence over Matthew's gospel. You could write that sentence over the New Testament. You could write that sentence over the whole Bible. What's the whole Bible about? Jesus, the perfect, pure Son of God. He joins us in our filth so that we can join him in his family. Because isn't that what love does? What does love do? Love joins the beloved in their plight. Here we are, we've got the Niagara Falls of light and life and love, and we've waltzed off, thinking, I'm off into a far country, I'm going to be free. And we end up lost and disconnected and fallen down into a pit. 
And what does love do when love sees the beloved in a pit? What does love do? Love says, your pit will be my pit. Your darkness will be my darkness. Your debts will be my debts. Your enemies, they've become my enemies now. I'll take them on. Your disconnection will become my disconnection. Your judgment will become my judgment. What we see Jesus doing in baptism sets him on that trajectory towards the cross. Where Jesus, in solidarity with us, says, I'm going to shoulder all your burdens. Do you have sin? I'll take it on myself. Do you face judgment? I'll take that judgment. Do you feel ashamed? I will bear that shame. He does what love does. He's not a sinner. Never sins, not once. But the perfect, pure Son of God joins us in our plight. He joins us in our filth. He goes all the way to the cross where on that cross he takes our sin and hell and judgment and takes it down to the the death that it deserves. And then he rises up again and he says, you in darkness, do you want my light? You in death, do you want my life? You in disconnection, do you want my love? It's for free and it's forever. So do you want Jesus? Listen, if, if you haven't been baptized and you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, I do want Jesus. That's because the Holy Spirit right now is waking you up to spiritual reality. You're getting connected. You are. In a moment, you might want to respond with some words. I'll offer you some words. The words aren't magic, but they might be one way that you can respond to the God who is connecting to you and saying, stop living the small, little life, disconnected, walking away from God. Stand with Jesus in those waters. And you know what happens? When you stand with Jesus in those waters, you get his father as your father. And you get his spirit as your spirit. And you get his future as your future. Let's just finish off the story. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You know what that is? That's the verdict you are made for. That's the love you were designed to enjoy. You were made for that love. You were made to stand in those waters with Jesus, your strong elder brother, at your right hand. Filled with the Spirit, hearing the one voice that really matters say, you're mine. I love you. I even like you. With you, I'm well pleased. Isn't that great? God doesn't just love you. He even likes you. Well, isn't that liberating? Don't you then want to drop the act? Forget the mask. Look bad in the presence of love. It's good news, isn't it? If you're a believer this morning, you need to hear this good news. I need to hear this good news again and again. Because I'm always trying to look good in the presence of judgment. Always. But if Jesus didn't mind looking like a sinner at the Jordan River. Why do I spend my whole life trying desperately not to be thought of as as a sinner, right? (laughs) I I spend my entire life trying desperate. I'm, I'm desperate to look righteous, even in your eyes and your fellow believers and You know I must be a mess because you're a mess and you know it. And you've read the Bible. You know I'm a mess. But I'm desperate to look good in your eyes. Jesus is so free from that concern. 
He didn't care about the optics. He just dived in with both feet into a family that is, a church family that is dysfunctional in lots of ways and messy. He didn't mind looking like a sinner, even though he's not. I mind terribly looking like a sinner, and I am. What am I like? Maybe this morning, maybe you need some prayer. There will be prayer offered later. Just that ability to confess to another brother or sister, look him in the eye and say, I, I am not the together, pristine, righteous person that I present. There's stuff going on. I need to get it out. Maybe this morning is an opportunity to look bad in the presence of love. Or maybe you're not a Christian yet, or, but you feel like maybe you're becoming one. Maybe, maybe you want this Jesus. Can I just offer some words that you might say back to Jesus? Um, the words are not magic. There's no magic spell to cast. There's no form that you've got to sign and tick every box. But if he's been speaking to you, and revealing himself to you, here are some words you can use to just answer back. The words will be something like this. It'll be something like, Jesus, you are love, and I'm not. And I feel my disconnection, and I feel my sin, and I'm sorry. Thank you for coming. Thank you for dying. Thank you for rising again. Please give me your life. Please give me your love. Please give me your spirit. Walk with me through my desert times and into your future. It'll be a prayer like that. Is that something you feel you might be able to pray this morning? Why don't we all bow our heads right now? And let me, let me lead in this kind of prayer. And, and you can do business with Jesus this morning. Lord Jesus. You are love. And I am far from love. And often I'm far from loving. And I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for running from you. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying my death on the cross. Thank you for rising to give me new life. Jesus, please fill me with your love. Fill me with your spirit. Make me to know heaven opened and a father beaming at me. I want to walk through this life with you as my Lord, with you as my leader. Be with me through this life and into your eternity. Amen. Friend, if you've prayed a prayer like that for the first time or you've come back to the Lord in a meaningful way, I'd love to hear from you at the end. If you can grab me, I'd love to shake you by the hand and help you take those first few steps with Jesus. If I'm not available, there'll be others who will be uh, available to pray. Uh, as you take your first steps with Jesus, don't do them alone. Christianity is a team sport. This is a great church where you can walk with Jesus with these brothers and sisters. Thanks so much.